Hi everybody, welcome back. We're going to start our new lesson here over topic 6.6, .6, which is a pretty short one that just focuses on really five properties of the definite integral that I want to outline for you in this particular video. And then we'll jump into example one to see a few ways that problems can be presented to you that require the use of some of those integration definite integral properties. So props to the properties. Let's take a look at topic 6.6. .6. So as you can see here, it starts with lots of boxes. And boxes sometimes mean things that you're going to have to pay close attention to. You would like to find yourself rereading these boxes before quizzes and before exams to bring yourself up to speed. And so these are the definite integral properties. The first two are probably the easiest to reason through that are on the left side. Now, through all of these properties, the function f and the function g are integrable. That means that there is nothing that's prohibiting us from finding their antiderivative, or as you know now, the area under their curves or between their curve and the x-axis. k is a constant number. If that is all true, then the function k times f, f plus g, and f minus g are also all going to be integrable on that same interval a to b. And this is what they look like. So basically, we're saying if you have a constant that's multiplied by your function and you're trying to integrate from a to b, you can just pull that constant out and then find the integral of that function as normal. How many times have you seen this in calculus? You've got a constant in front of a function. You're taking its limit. Bring the constant out. We just did that not too terribly long ago. You've got a constant in front of a function. You're taking its derivative. Bring the constant out in front. It's no secret that you're going to do the same thing to integrals. The additive property for integrals just simply means if you're taking the integral of f plus g, you can just take the integral of f plus the integral of g. Likewise, you can split it up if it were a subtraction. Again, the same property applies for limits and for derivatives. So I think those two are very reasonable, things that you're probably already assuming to be true anyway. The third one over here, uh, it's referred to as the additive interval property. This one's very powerful, and I think this is the one that I'm going to try to focus on a little bit more, especially in one of my uh, sub-examples today. But let's say that you're trying to find the integral of a function from a to b, but for whatever reason you're having difficulty traveling from the very far left a to the very far right b. But let's say that you have information about what's happening in subsets of that entire interval. So basically this is this property is just saying that if you've got some curve and here's your a and extend that a bit here's your b you can simply use c as a go between and the integral from a to c which is all of this shaded area region added to the integral from c to b, which would be this shaded area region, would comprise the entire area from a to b. So it seems logical that that would work. And you'll see instances where you might need to do something like that here in just a little bit. And then we're going to end with a couple of special definite integrals that you've kind of been exposed to. One of the things that I like to do as a teacher is expose you to some ideas without giving you a lot of scaffolding to see how you work through them, to see how you productively struggle, and then we'll formalize it and try to get you guys a little bit more confident with it uh, in the day or two afterwards. And one of those is that if f is defined, say, x equal a, if you try to integrate f from a to a, if the boundaries are the same, we're going to get zero every time. You just don't have any kind of width for which you can apply some area. And then the last one, if f is integrable on a to b, then if you were to swap the boundaries of integration, if the a and the b were to trade places from their former positions, then you just have an opposite relationship. One is negative, the other would be the positive. And we're going to use that here in a bit too. With that, Let's get started with our example one.
So our example one consists of just two parts here. And we're asked to evaluate the definite integral. So in part A, evaluate the integration of f of x plus 6 from 1 to 3 if you know that the integration of f of x from uh, 1 to 3 is 10. So we don't need some fancy equation for f of x. We don't need a graph. We've got the information that we need. What we have to do with this is determine that we can split up this addition by using our second property from above. This guy right here, the additive property for integrals. So you'll integrate from 1 to 3 of f of x, and technically you should put the dx with him as well as you should put the dx with this integral that you're adding, which is the integration of x with respect to x, because those dx's are going to stand for the width of that particular region. Now, we already know that the integral of f from 1 to 3 is 10, and thank goodness, because we didn't know anything about f. Now, the thing that I want you to start to realize is that you can integrate constants all day long. Even if you're sitting right now in topic 6.6 and you're following the CED as prescribed by the College Board, it's likely maybe you haven't even learned how to integrate 6. Maybe you don't know that that's 6 times x. You're going to learn that in one more day or two, but that's okay if you don't know that because you can think of this geometrically. It works wonderfully because if you think about the graph of 6, it's like, what does that look like? What is the graph of 6? Well, I will tell you what the graph of 6 looks like. The graph of 6 is just a horizontal line up here at 6. Yes. Okay, well, what about finding the area between a equal 1 and 3? Well, that would just simply be how far you would go from here to here. So you're looking for all of this wonderful, beautiful, shaded region. Well, that's just a rectangle. That is a rectangle that's 2 by 6, which would give it an area of 12. And so you simply just insert 12 in the right color <laughs> for that integral, and then you have 22 as your answer. Okay, if you haven't figured it out, an easy way to integrate a constant with boundaries is to subtract the boundaries and multiply by the constant that you're integrating, and it will always work, as long as you subtract the top boundary minus the bottom boundary. All right, let's take a look at Part B. Part B is a little bit uh, more involved. This time you want to evaluate from negative 2 to 5, 3f of x minus g of x. And you're given lots of information here. A couple of integrals about f and a single integral about g. The integral about f travels from negative 2 to 3 in a 6. The integral next is from 5 lower bound to 3 upper bound hmm, of f of x, which is 3. And then lastly, you have an integration of g of x from negative 2 to 5, which is negative 4. Well, the first thing that you're going to want to tackle with this problem, as you can probably imagine, is how to handle this subtraction. And I want to tell you, a lot of times during these videos, I really have the desire for you to just tune me out, hit that pause button, don't stop, don't go, on, don't go to Netflix, hit the pause button, keep your browser up, and try this problem on your own. See what you would think uh, would work with this given information. And I promise you, you're going to get a lot more out of these lessons that way, because then you can go into the solution, you can hit the resume button and see where our ideas came together and maybe where our ideas were far apart. And then you're gonna be able to remember those things, remember those experiences when you come and take quizzes and tests and, and work on other problems. So give it a pause and try it and see what happens. Hopefully what you thought to do was to split this apart at the minus. And in addition to splitting it apart at this minus, we can go ahead and bring this 3 out to the front. And we're essentially using both of our first two rules. I'll highlight those rules here in just a moment. The rules that I speak of, the constant multiple rule, and then the subtraction version of this additive property. 
Now, I don't think that this guy right here is the problem because we're told that all of this is equal to negative 4. The problem lies more in this integral of f from negative 2 to 5, how we don't really have that. We have an integral that starts at negative 2, but oh darn it, it stops at 3. And then we have this wacky thing. And I'm going to tell you, this is the thing that really causes issue. We really want to resume this first integral where we left off at the upper bound of 3. But you can see that the 3 is placed in the upper bound here. But if you look at this special definite integral property, we can use that to flip the 3 and the 5 of that same function and know that it's going to result in the opposite answer, in this case, negative 3. And that's where it comes into play. So what you've got really going on here is 3 multiplied by, and it's likely that you may not even have to write this integral out like these anymore because you could just use the numbers that they produce. But for the purpose of the video, I'm going to write out the the, um, the integration. So I'm going to go from negative 2 to 3 because I know stuff about that integral. It's equal to 6. And then I am going to handle this one of two different ways. Well, I'll just say I'll add the integral from 3 to 5. How's that? That's one way to, to handle it. Probably the best way to handle it. You could have put the minus out in front and drop that in, but I'm going to go ahead and use this version that I discovered. And then, of course, minus untouched version of our last integral expression. Okay, where does this take us now? We're going to have our 3 multiplied by the quantity. Our first integral here is 6, so we plop the 6 down there. And then we're going to add what is to be a negative 3. Now when you add a negative 3, that's the same thing as subtracting 3, but if it bothers you to think of it like that temporarily, we can just write it like that. Then we have a subtraction that's built in to our formula here. And then we finish up with this result, which is a negative 4. So you've got a double negative there. And then if you just do the math, you have 3 multiply by positive 3, add 4. And the final answer is 13. And those would finish up our first example. Obviously, there are a lot of things that can go wrong in a problem like Part B with the way that you break things up, with the way that you might have interpreted this integral, and with the signs. So you don't want to take these problems lightly. The good thing is, is they're, they don't require a lot of heavy lifting. In other words, they don't require a lot of complicated algebraic steps, but they really focus on you having a really strong understanding of these five definite integral properties. A couple more videos on your way that will round out this short topic. Make sure you tune into those as well. We always thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.